How you guys doing this morning? Oh, you, know, you need to do better. That's 2019. How you doing this morning? That's right. If you don't feel good, act like you do. Line up, right? It's like when people say, hey, like before you preach, it's like something that I don't know if it's like church folk, but they go, are you ready? And I always say the same thing. Does it matter? It's coming. 2019, are you ready? It doesn't matter. It's here. Amen? So you need to get a mindset of a new year. Look, I'm not, I'm not just talking about resolutions. That stuff's all good. There is some value to that. But what I'm saying is you need to get into a mindset and you have choices. Because if you don't change in 2019, at best, it will be the same as 2018. At best. But if you have a mindset of change, 2019 has more to offer. God loves opportunities to reset and restart. That's why he gives us days. How many said, man, I'm glad that day was over. Man, I'm glad that month was over. Man, I'm glad that year was over. Man, I'm glad that five minutes was over. Right? So he gives us opportunities to renew our mind because it gives us time, gives us the ability to change a mindset. 2019, four years ago before I started the church, um, I attended CFTN Central at a service, and I just answered the altar call, and Pastor Mark Jackson was up there, and he prophesied over me. He never have met me, didn't know anything about me, and he said, I see that you have a heart for the people. He says, you are called to ministry. He didn't know that I had pastored for years. He didn't know what had happened in my life. He says, but I have a picture of the devil taking you by the feet and striking the earth with you over and over and over. And I'm thinking, that was my last year. Right? That was before Avengers. So that was before the Hulk smash. That was the devil smash. So he, he said, I see that. He was striking you over and over and over, trying to destroy you in the calling on your life and the ministry. He said, but as he started to impact the earth with you, the earth began to yield and the anointing began to flow. And the impact of yourself was greater on the people than him on you. So what God or what the enemy intended for evil, God used for Good, because when God allows the enemy or you choose to allow the enemy to humble you, that's where the anointing flows and you can be more significant and make a greater impact in the earth. Because how many know prideful people don't make an impact? Amen? So the word that God gave me for the 2019 is the year of impact. The year of impact. Amen? No, you don't get it. How many of you had a terrible 2018? You don't have to admit it. I don't care. I'm not taking numbers. How many of you had a great 2018? 2019 promises one thing, and it's more. It's the year of impact. I believe that 2018, even if it was great, even if it was decent, even if it was subpar, has prepared you to make a serious impact in 2019. So 2018 may have been about God working on you. 2019 is about God using you to touch others. Rather than doing something in here, God is going to equip the people in here to start to impact the people out there. Amen? Next Sunday night. Some pastors of the city, some churches are gathering in downtown Chandler. We'll be a part of it. I'll get you the details next week. There's some flyers that we have. But we're going to go and we're going to pray over the city. The new mayor is going to be there. Some congressmen are going to be there. Because we're not here to exist in here. We're here to make an impact out there. Amen? You come here to make an impact in your home. Nobody. Amen? You need to get that mindset that you are a person of impact. You are a person that's called to impact the lives of others. And if the enemy can keep us self-focused, you'll never make an impact on another life. The promises of God are exciting, but we do need the process. We do need the process. I had never in my life dreamed that the enemy smashing me to the earth and having a year of hell was a part of the process in my life. 
though my decisions line me up with it and set me up for it, God set me up for a comeback. Amen? So even the decisions that you've made or the things that have happened to you have positioned you for 2019 to make an impact in the lives of other people. So you have to understand, we are the igniters of the impact. We are the people that make a decision and choose to impact the lives of others. You can walk down the street, you can drive your car, you can go to work, you can keep to yourself and take care of yourself and look out for number one and have no impact world at all. Impact is a verb. Number one, come into forcible contact with another object. Have you ever braced yourself for impact? Have you ever known you were going to crash and you do the whole, and they say bracing yourself for impact is more dangerous than being relaxed? See, you don't have to brace yourself for the impact when you are the impact. When you see someone coming out of the corner of your eye and you're jumping for the football, they're not bracing for impact. They're delivering it. You brace for it, right? You see that in football all the time. The person that, that's not ready for impact, and that's it. Look, 2019 can impact you or you can impact it. You can wait for it to hit you, or you can decide to be the force that impacts 2019. It's just like Finney said. They said, or sorry, it was... Um, Smith Wigglesworth, they said, Smith, how's the day treating you? He goes, the day doesn't treat me. I am treating it well. <laughs> Come on. You don't get it. Stop waiting for your day to happen and happen to your day. Amen? You need to get up with that kind of mindset and say, I'm going to impact this day. Not let one thing throw you off course. So having a mindset of impact. I love the synonyms. Uh, the syn synonyms. Synonyms, M&Ms, <laughs> vacations, crash into, smash into, collide with, hit, strike, ram, smack into, bang into, slam into. Very common words for the new year. Number two, have a strong effect on someone or something. Affect, influence, or have an effect on. You are called to have an impact on people. So we're not talking about the forcible collision, though we are talking about a commonality where we can discuss things with real people without using slurs and name calling and mudslinging. Amen? Don't let your Facebook page um, uh, look like a politician's. All they do is throw mud back and forth. If you keep labeling people, you're covering up the real problem. You don't get it. If there's 10 people in a line and you call them all racist, all you did was cover up the one that really is. Because no one knows what it is anymore. If everybody's racist, nobody's racist. You can't fix everything. You can't fix everyone. But if you can identify a problem, you can deal with a problem. But if there's five people and you call them all the same thing, then the person that really is hides behind the shield. Do you get it? Not everybody's a misogynist. Not everybody's a homophobic which I would call it heteroistic because no one's afraid. Look, I'm not, against, I'm not against people. I'm against agendas in our earth. But homophobic suggests that people are afraid of homosexuals. Phobia means fear. I'm not afraid. I don't agree. The Bible doesn't agree. I'm not afraid of them. I love those people. God loves those people. Homosexuality, that sin is no greater than the sin of fornication before marriage. It's no different than lying, stealing, and cheating. It's a sin in our society like all sins. And Christ came to deliver us from all sins. But I'm not afraid of sin. I fear God. Amen? So I'm heteroistic. I'm not homophobic. Amen? Is that okay? We can talk about real life, right? Okay. So the only limit to your impact is your commitment and your passion. Your commitment and your passion. My kids have a commitment and a passion for Fortnite. My son makes an impact. He has over 117 wins in a 50-man group, and if he's not in the top five, he's upset. The kingdom of God is not about title or designation. It's about impact, impact, influence, and inspiration. Look, 
we don't need more cynical people. We don't need more critics. We need more people that are influential, inspirational, and impactful. Be that type of person. If you're not sure what kind of person you are, go read your Facebook post. Can you believe you're cynical? Again, look at this, and your four friends that agree with you, yeah, no influence. Listen, if you run around hating on everything, no one will trust your opinion. They deem you in a category of the irrelevant. But when you offer something that's inspirational, when you offer, offer something that's impactful, when people get around you and they go, man, I feel that, that's the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't go to hate on the Pharisees. He dealt with them, but he preached the kingdom of God and the goodness of God. That's what you need to be preaching if you want to be influential, if you want to be impactful. You can sit around and complain. We'll just call you American. <laughs> so in Acts chapter 11, we're looking for an example. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30, we're talking about the church in Antioch. We're talking about the church in Antioch because this is how the church is supposed to operate. The church in Antioch became the hub. It was the third largest church in the Roman Empire. It was known, Antioch was known for their, for their industry and their sin. But yet it became the most powerful place in the gospel when they started the church. Now, those who have been scattered by the persecuted that broke out, uh, broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So there was persecution in Jerusalem. All these scattered people came to Antioch, a place known for its sin, and started sharing the gospel, not with the Jews, but also for the first time started migrating to the Greeks. So when they did it, people started getting saved. And I hear pastors, well, you don't understand. Our city's tough. We have a small city. There's nothing for the young people to do. Then you have the large city. Oh, my God, our city's tough. It's so big, there's so many things to do. Like, there's always an excuse. But the truth is, if the people of God will choose to be influential, impactful, and inspiring, they will change a city. Because people may be drawn to negative stuff on social media, but they're drawn to the positive stuff in life. Amen? So... It says, news reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw the grace of God, what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, taught a great number of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some of the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood out through this. <clears throat> Sorry, still recovering from some, some sickness. The spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for brothers and sisters living in Judea. They, they did, this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So, third largest city in the Roman Empire, known for commerce and sin. In spite of a difficult spiritual climate, they made an impact that literally became the hub to impact the world. Amen? So, your circle, your situation may be dire. There may be oppression. There may be past abuse. If you recognize that God can do in your life what he did in Antioch, your life can be a hub of impact to touch other people. From the greatest of places... Does God raise up the prophets? See, he's looking not to raise up critics, but to raise up prophets to the nations. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, And from that time John the Baptist began preaching and baptizing. Tell now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcibly advancing. That's impact. Forcibly advancing. See, if you will hold your ground, God will advance the kingdom. If you don't give in, if you don't laugh at the stupid joke, do you hear me, Christians? 
When someone says something totally out of line or something about God and you go, <laughs> that's agreement. He's not even asking you to tell him, hey, and call him out. He's asking you to hold your ground. Amen? When someone says something in society that right now is supposed to be okay, like how many genders there are, and you go, <laughs> that's agreement. Stop. Just say, I don't agree with that. Don't be rude. It's open for discussion. If you can't have a discussion about politics and not get angry, you are the problem. If you name, call, and go, well, all you, you start talking like that, you're the problem. That's not what we're called in a kingdom culture. We can enter into any culture and have a conversation whether we agree or not because we love people. Right? Right-wingers, communists, libtards, all this ridiculousness doesn't come from a mouth of someone that worships the king. It comes from people that are conforming to the patterns of society and grouping with people that don't speak on behalf of God. We are not those people. We are not those people. See, we need to be convicted and convinced that we still can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Are you convinced of that in 2019? No? I'm glad I'm going to preach a sermon then. Number one, how to make an impact. You need to reset to restart. You need to reset to restart. You remember the old computer, what? Control, alt, delete. That's 2018. You don't get it, you're like, yeah, I need a restart. No, 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 no. You need to reset to restart. You don't get it. Have you ever been working on something and your computer freezes and you have to reset it? Does it make you happy? Why? Because you have to stop everything you were doing and know that you might lose some things when you restart. Welcome to 2019. God wants you to stop everything that you were doing. And when you restart, he'll show you the stuff that you can move forward with. You have to trust him with a reset so you can restart. See, we don't want to reset. We just, God, restart me. And we want to take all the same junk with us. But some of it needs to get lost in the reset. Amen? You ever lost something and you're like, I can't find it. Some of it shouldn't be found or looked for. Some of it's okay just leaving it behind. God's going to help you clear out your hard drive so you have a little more room to function. Amen? You can't start something new unless you stop something old. Everybody has 24 hours, regardless how you use it. If you want to start doing devotionals in the morning, you're going to have to stop doing something else for an hour. It might be sleep. It might be internet surfing. It might be whatever you do, you have to give up something to do something. There has to be a reset to restart. We keep talking about restart, but we don't want to reset. Amen? Acts, two ten, two, uh, Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, suddenly sound like the blowing of a violent wind. That word violent comes out a lot in the Bible, doesn't it? Maybe that's why I read it. It came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. How about that for a reset? We miss Jesus. We miss Jesus. No, the comforter will come. We're going to miss you, Jesus. We'll go with you. No, it's better if he comes. No, Jesus, Holy Spirit. We're going to preach Jesus. They stopped missing Jesus and they started preaching Jesus. They reset. It was a change. They stopped mourning and they walked out the mission. Right? That's what the encounter is. If you need a reset, everybody say, I do. Don't worry, we didn't get married. If you need a reset, you need to get to the encounter. It is the reset so you can restart. Amen? So they let go of Jesus on earth and embraced the comforter that was sent. They let go of something and embraced the next level. Amen? The past was gone. The veil is torn. 2018 is dead. Welcome to 2019. No, 2018 ain't gone. It's dead. It cannot be relived. It doesn't need to be rethought. You can have some reflection time and then move on. Right? Write down all your reflections. Take an action plan. Throw away the reflections. Keep the action plan. Amen? There's nothing for you in 2018. 
except for a step to 2019. Choose to make an impact. See, he doesn't want to just reset you. It's actually a renewing. He doesn't want to rehab you. You all see the house rehabs? He doesn't want to rehab your house. He wants to tear the whole thing down and build something new. Amen? But you could use this. No, thanks. But this is my best doorknob. No, thanks. Complete destruction, complete rebuilding. That's God's process. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Not rebuilt, not remodeled, renewed. Amen? He doesn't want your rebuilt mind. Because it still has some of your parts. He wants a renewed mind, the mind of Christ. I was reading in Psalm on January 1st, in Psalm 1, it says this. Instead, you thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night. Listen to this. You're a tree replanted in Eden. Oh, you don't get it. He doesn't want to take you back to the place you failed. He doesn't want to take you back to the place just before you fell. He wants you to take, take you back before sin existed where man sat in God's presence in the garden. He doesn't want to plant you in a different place. He wants to plant you in his presence in the Garden of Eden and have a relationship with you. Amen? In Proverbs 1, it says, simpletons, how long will you wallow in ignorance? Cynics, we discussed that. How long will you feed your cynicism? Idiots, how long will you refuse to learn? Not my words. Message paraphrase. About face, and I can revise your life. See, about face isn't like this. That's how God, just take a slow turn. Listen, you're not a big boat. You need to do a 360. Right, you ain't the Titanic. Well, we got to turn it slow. No, you ain't that big. You small. Here's what about face looks like. That's it. There's no extra room. There's not one day I'll get there. I'm working on it. I got a center ground. You know what I mean? To the left. It's, it's straight about face. That's it. We keep doing these maneuvers, and God says, hey, you want a new life? Boom. Right? When I was in the military, I never thought that was going to be the most important move, but it is in God. Look, stop saying, you know what, man? <sighs> Come Monday, two-day. Come next month, two-day. About face. Right? Preparatory command, a command. That means God gives you warning. About face. Action. That's how long you get. You get to hear it, receive it, and act on it. There's no, you know, I just, that right there is wasting time in 2019. You want to restart? You don't get a restart without a reset about face. You know what happens when you about face? Check this out. I can revise your life. Look, I'm ready to pour out my spirit on you. I'm ready to tell you all that I know about face. Amen? Don't wean off something. Cut it off. So number two. First was reset to restart. Number two, seeking significance over success. Everybody in the world is trying to be successful, but people are missing the significance of the kingdom. Amen? Churches are trying to be successful. How many people come to your church, brother? I always say the same thing. Oh, between two and 3,000. They go, really? And you're only three years old? Yeah, between the number two and the no number 3,000, somewhere in there. Because they want to measure our success. Jesus, they go, how many are in your church? He goes, 12. That's all I got. Because he wasn't looking for success, he sent people away in John 6, 66. He gave them hard teachings. Some left. I'm not, te I'm not suggesting every church that preaches hard and people leave is somehow fulfilling the Great Commission. But what I'm saying is, if you seek significance, success will take care of itself. But if you seek success, you might miss significance, which means you'll never make an impact. I had someone tell me, well, my company's doubled in its employees. I said, great. That's not significance. That's success. How are the people doing? How are the families doing? How are your family doing? And what are you doing to impact other people? 
That's significance. We don't discard success. We recognize it. But it's not our first pursuit. People in churches have chosen consciously or unconsciously to pursue success over significance because success is applauded now. Significance might not be applauded till you're gone. Amen? Success is applauded now. Significance might not be recognized till you're gone. How many musicians got started in the church and ended in the world? How many pastors chose to go around and itinerate and make money rather than to develop people? See, you got to be careful to understand your gifts and your calling. They are not the same. Because if you want people to recognize your gifts and you keep talking about your gifts, you are susceptible to selling your gift to the highest bidder and prostituting your calling. I'm a worship leader. I'll go wherever I can make the most. Is that success or significance? And I'm not suggesting you shouldn't uh, be rewarded for the things you do or the work that you do. But what I'm saying is if you seek success, you might lose your significance. If you seek everybody to recognize your gifts, you might never know your calling. Because if you want people to applaud your gifts, they'll never know your calling. See, gifts, gifts get better when you practice Calling gets identified when you pray. God, let us be more of a praying church than a practicing church. That we would operate in our calling and have the greatest impact on the lives around us. Some of the most successful people in ministry, outside of ministry, will have the least significance. And there's people you never heard of that have the greatest significance. Think about the people that have had significance in your life. Are they always the most successful? Sometimes. But the people that had significant points in your life, your parents, your grandparents, leaders, bosses, friends, mentors, those people you need to recognize, you want to be like those people that made a significant impact in your life more than the people that are successful, right? It's good to be successful. My partners and I, we started a business. Jim's dream was to have a business that fueled the kingdom. That was Jim's dream. I didn't have a dream of doing a business at all. Willie was super connected with a church prior to moving to Phoenix, and God used the business to connect him back to his calling in the kingdom. Our desire is to make a significant impact, and God's blessed us with success. Amen? Listen, success comes and goes with the economy. Significance is continual. Success ends the day you die. You can't take it with you. Success is never enough. Significance will always outlive you. Success satisfies our flesh. Nailed it. Owned it. Right? Mic drop. Significance satisfies your soul. I made a difference in a life, lives, cities, nations. And other countries. Don't chase success. Start by seeking significance. Amen? You need to realize life will not last forever. Live a life worth copying and help other people copy it. Amen? If you don't live a life worth copying, please don't teach people to copy it. That wasn't in my notes. That was for free. Focus on people, not money. Amen? Start with one person and try to make an impact and have significance in their life. Help them. I mean, obviously your children, but outside of that, start to develop people in your life that you want to make an impact on. The people that are already your friends, are you making a significant impact on their life or are you just hanging out? I'm so thankful for my friends because they make such a profound impact in my life. My friends are not just casual friends. My friends, seriously, are people of significance in my life. I'm blessed like that. My wife has a significant impact on my life, my thinking. All of my friends, my business partners, they, may, they have significant roles in my life. They're not just casual friends. And here's a good one. Find a life purpose. Outside your job. 
You like that? Look, it doesn't say don't work well, don't develop your business. God's hands on you. I believe God wants people to impact the business world for Jesus Christ, right? That they would be known in every atmosphere of our society. But I want you to say, hey, this isn't my only purpose. It's a part of my purpose. Amen? And realize significance is not dependent upon success. Rarely do people look back on their lives and savor their professional achievements. I was in hospice. I used to ask people that were passing, hey, what are three things that you're glad you did and three things you wish you did? It never had to do with success. It always had to do with significance, family, and impact. Understand that now and live a life of significance. Mother Teresa had a life of impact. Right? You start to look at these people. Billy Graham had a life of impact. These people, you look at the people that impact, I'm, I'm talking about famous people that we know, but I'm talking about what about the people that made an impact in your life? Can you be that for somebody else? That's why we do connect groups, try to surround you with people that actually have an impact on your life. When you go hang out with someone, are you impacting them for the kingdom? Me and my friends, when we go golfing with people that don't know Jesus, we tend to irritate them for Christ in a very positive, joyful way. I had one of them, he wrote me, he said, I just want to thank you for being my friend and my mentor. I said, whoa, 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 let's not act like you're doing anything I'm saying. Let's just start with friend. <laughs> and he is my friend. Number three, alignment for assignment. Alignment for assignment. If you're waiting for an assignment, God, I don't know what to do. You need to align yourself with authority. Right? If you want the blessing, you see so many, so many people are blessed in the church. Are you aligned with the vision of the church? Not this church, what church you attend. If you align yourself, now you get the blessings of the church. When you align yourself with authority, authority will open doors that you're meant to walk through that you don't have the key to. Amen? I went and preached in Brazil to over, I don't know, five to 7,000 youth. Guess what? I wasn't invited. Someone invited me that was going. They opened the door. I was meant to minister. It was a powerful meeting, but I couldn't have got there unless I aligned myself with the person that invited me. Right? Align yourself with the authority in your family. Stop rebelling and pushing against your parents. You need to align yourself with your parents and the authority in your home, and they will open doors for you, and they'll give you money. <laughs> if you don't align yourself, you get very little. Trust me, when you align yourself and you make your parents happy and rejoice, you just get more. It's just a spiritual concept. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. And I was listening to Pastor Jeremy Foster. He said, this is it. It's, it's you move, he moves. Amen. We keep going, God, I'm waiting on you. And he's like, I'm waiting on you. Right? James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Meaning, get in line and understand. You can't get a promise without a process. You can't keep talking about the promises, I got a word, I got a word, I got a word. When are you going to start the process? Amen? Because you will be stuck with the promises of 2017 and be living in 2019 until you align yourself with the process that takes you to the promise. Don't have the promises in 2019. You don't need to wait till 2020 because you didn't line up. Because when you get aligned, you get assigned. Amen? If you will, God will. Ask and you will. Seek and you will. Knock and the door will. Do you see there's over a hundred scriptures that says, you do, I do. And then we go, you do it. <laughs> you do, I do. You move, I move. Draw close to me, I draw close to you. You draw close first. Right? And we live this life waiting on God. Power and authority. See, the Bible's not a book of destiny. It's a book of decisions. Did you hear me? The promises are only promises if you own the commands. It is a book of decisions. You can't make decisions against the word of God and hope to walk in the promises of God. You have to walk in the promise of God. So you have to ask yourself, God, why am I in this situation? He says, have you aligned yourself with my word? Then I will assign you to the promise. But if you haven't aligned yourself, it's just like being reset, like a bone out of joint, right? You can't make an impact if you've got a broken elbow 
or you only do it once, right? You need to be realigned or reset, re-strengthened, healed, and make an impact. That's why it's not okay to stay broken. Because you need to be reset. Some of you have been hurt, been hurt, wounded. You need to be reset. That bone needs to be reset. That's where you receive healing. But if you refuse to reset, it'll never be healed. You ever seen someone like my dad? Is he here, Mom? Good. Okay. <laughs> my dad was from Baltimore, raised seven brothers. You know, his mom basically raised by his brothers. And they're crazy, like crazy. I don't know why mom married him, but he's crazy. So he, he used to catch semi-pro fast pitch softball, right? So he's catching this guy from New Zealand, throws 105 miles an hour, right? He's the catcher. He calls a drop, the guy throws a riser. He puts his glove down, hand up. The ball catches his pinky and snaps it. It's literally, right? So dad, you know, being dad, tapes it up, finishes the game, right? Mom makes him go to the hospital because he doesn't do that. And they go and they put a pin in there to reset his finger. Well, after how long is it, a week? Dad decided he didn't need the pin no more. He pulled it out of the bone. Okay, if you look at my dad, his finger's like this. Spiritually, that's what happens when you don't let God reset your wounds. You start to have these abnormalities in your spiritual walk. And you start to look at them as if they're normal because they've been like that for years. So if you go to the doctor, you know what he's going to do? He's going to re-break it. This is not the answer. I can deal with it. He don't want you to deal with it. He wants you to take you back to Eden, how you were intended to be. Some of the things that you healed up that never got fixed, he needs to re-break in the encounter, line it up, and provide real healing. And then you go, that's how that thing's supposed to work. Now I can function in the kingdom. Amen? <laughs> Brokenness is supposed to be a heart condition before God, not a spiritual condition that the enemy can use. God determines your destiny, but you determine your destination. Did you hear me? You move, he moves, right? He said, most assuredly, I say, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also greater works than these we do because I go to the Father. See, we think we're disqualified because of the decisions we've made. I'm telling you, you're not disqualified for the decisions you're made. You'll be disqualified because the decisions you're making. Did you get it? I don't care about decisions you made in 2018. What are the decisions you're making in 2019? Amen? It don't matter if you made all the wrong decisions. 2019, align with the authority of God and make all the right ones. And see if he doesn't do a work in you, he'll blow the minds of everybody around you. So Moses... I love this in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 through 15. But Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of your Lord. Um, one version says, stand still. This is not correct grammar. Many of us are standing still, right? Stand still, be still. You always hear those verses? You know none of those mean sit down, right? None of those mean stop. We just may, you know, I'm just, I'm going to stand still and wait on God. Okay, let me tell you, here's, let's finish this verse to show you what God's standstill means. Stand by and see the sal salvation, Lord, which he's accomplished for you today. For the Egyptians who you've seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you and keep you and, and with you keep silent. So he says, be quiet, right? And in our version, it says, sit still, be quiet, and I'll fight for you. And we go, awesome. I'm waiting on God. Next verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Be still, move. Be still, move. Be still, I'm with you, move. See, be still, the word literally means relax, not stop. So when you're stressing out, he's not telling you to stop and be still and wait. He's telling you, hey, chill out. I got you. Then he goes, move. You <laughs> When you're stressed out and freaking out, you're like, I just need to be still and know he's God. He goes, what you need to do is stop making that face and doing your shoulders like that. <laughs> this is not doing anything. What you need to do is go like this and go, Holy Ghost. And then he goes, move on. Do you get it? Don't stop. Move on. Relax and move on. Chill out. Move on. Be still. Chill and keep going. Not chill and stop. 
not sit down, not lay down, not shut down, not wait, relax, go to work. You like that? I'm having a bad day at work. Hey, relax. You okay? Yeah, go back to work. In Jesus' name. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still, not stand still. If you align yourself with what God has called you to do, you already have everything you need. You just need to relax and realize, hey, this is too much for me. Chill. I've equipped you with everything you need for every trial. I will fight for you and with you. I will bring you through it, not take you out of it. Come with me. I'll develop your character because on the other side of this pain and this process is the promise that I told you. Right? Be still and move forward in 2019. I always do this. I always go, have I ever done anything like this before? I have done worse than this. And you can do this. I don't like it. That's okay. Be still. All right. Let's go. Right? That's your mindset. You have to exercise what you have access to. Look, God's called you to, to walk through what you're in right now. I know this is all easy message, but whatever you're in right now, relax. God's got you. He's brought you this far, I know, because you're sitting here. Guess what? Relax. Align yourself with authority and move forward. Align yourself with God's word and you'll get his blessing and promise. Make decisions that show God that you understand the alignment and all of a sudden he'll reveal your assignment. If they wouldn't have moved forward, Moses wouldn't have separated the Red Sea. They never would have saw it. They never would have passed through it. They never would have got the promise. But a lot of times in our lives, have you ever felt like he brought you out of one trial to put you in a bigger one? You're like, yeah, I made it. What the? I was better off back there. At least I had meat to eat, right? But listen, God understands the process. Your job is to trust. Trust him and align with him, and he'll bring you through it. Stop in times of pressure stepping out of line. You need to step back in line because that's when it's the easiest, right? When things are going great, it's easy to step out of line. When things are going terrible, it's easy to step out of line. He goes, look, align yourself, and I'll show you your assignment. If you're looking for significance, I'll show you your assignment. Look, you don't have to stop anything that's positive that God's doing in your life. But what you need to do is just relax, let him speak, and move. That's it. Psalm 23. I'm finishing with this. Cameron, where are you at? David known as a man after God's own heart. This is already complex. I mean, you've been in church long enough, you hear it and you go, that's right, you know. But if you read the Bible, you go, that's wrong. He was jacked up more than most of us, some of us, a few of us. And you don't have to operate in this sense of perfection because it's what it's doing is putting up a lie. I know we try to put our best foot forward. I know we try to act like we have everything together. I'm not suggesting that you make yourself vulnerable to untrustworthy people, but you have to start living a real life in 2019. Don't put out a facade. Don't try to act like you have it all together because a lot of times you come into church, you look around, you go, well, I saw their Facebook post. You know, they're so happy. You know, I took 500 pictures to get that one, but they're so happy. You know, the wife's like, not that one, not that one, not that one. You know, so they choose the one where the wife looks beautiful and the guy's like, perfect, perfect. It amazes me, you take a picture of 20 people and you hand it to any woman and they zoom in on them and they go, no, that's no good. Men are like, I always look that bad. But sometimes the focus just gets on us. And we forget that God's greater than that. And kind of like a social media post, we're trying to posture our lives in such a way that people will go, you're beautiful. Your life is something to be sought after. We try to do this, and we try to do all these takes just like getting the right picture. We try to put out the right facade. And I'm not suggesting that we don't give people our best. And I don't suggest that we share our junk with everybody. What I'm saying is it's okay to be a real person. And you need to stop looking at those people thinking they live perfect lives because I know a lot of them, and they're not. They're just people that want to live for God like you want to live for God. 
And if you keep comparing yourself to people, you know, you have people like Dr. Cho that go, I have too much going on not to pray eight hours a day. And you think, God, I have a hard time praying for eight minutes. Let him do it. Stop comparing yourself with people's callings and gifts and do what God's called you to do. You can be inspired by people, but you don't have to try to be like them. God's gifted them and called them in different ways. What you get to choose is to reset, to restart. It's brand new. You don't get it, it's brand new. That's where your hope comes, it's brand new. You get to choose significance this year over success. How can I make an impact? How can I do what God's called me to do, yet take time to make a significant impact in the lives of others? And then you get to align yourself so we can show you your greater assignment. Look, all that requires letting go of the past because the filter will blur those things. Your past will start to fill in the blanks rather than letting the Holy Spirit do it because that's what you've always done. That's how I used to do it. This is what I do, right? You start to believe that everybody has some selfish motive in your life because the people that have been in your life have hurt you. It's simply a perspective that isn't true. God's ways are not our ways. He, don't, he doesn't see people the way that you see them. And when you start seeing them the way he does, you can make a significant impact in their life. If you see a young person that's a juvenile delinquent and probably doing prison time, you can see them as a, a monstrosity, but God sees them as a person that he created with a destiny and a calling. If you can see that, you can speak into it and you can make a significant impact. Josh is now going with pastors into the prison. But if he didn't align himself with the pastors, he would never have access to the prisons. Align yourself with the things of God. I love this, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me, say he. Say he. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now it gets deeper. This is when it gets hard. This is, see, it's all good till now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, say you, there's been a transition. You went from he, third person, to you, first person. Because, yea, though I walk through, when you move forward and it gets dark, God moves closer as promised. He went from, you, from he to you. He went from distant talking about him to in the valley, shadow of the valley of death, talking to him. See, in your greatest trials, as you walk through it, God will come closer to you. It goes from third person to first person in your life. If you're going through a trial, he has become you. He is close to you. And I have something else to share with you. There's something required for a shadow. It's light. If you're in the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death, move around the shadow and you'll find the light. Because there is no shadow without the light. And you know why God allows shadows in our lives? It's a shadow box. Right? When you're feeling scared, you don't know why, that's when you're shadow boxing. That's when you're working. He's, it's all practice for the practical, for when the trial comes, you'll be prepared for the promise. Amen? Come on, let's be standing. God is close to you today. And it's in that time, he says, you prepare a table before my enemies. He will use your haters to become your elevators. Amen? The people that oppose you, he will use to bless you. That's God, what he does. And at the end of the pain, at the end of the journey, you'll find that the promise is yes and amen. God's going to come close to you in 2019 as you walk this out in your life. That's my heart for you. That's my prayer for you. That God will be closer to you no matter what you're going through. 
great accomplishments, difficult trials, some of each, that God will be closer to you in 2019 than in 2018. That you'll know that you're not alone, that it'll go from he to you this year. Instead of saying, God, and talking about him, you need to start talking to him. Draw close to him. He'll draw close to you. Some of you have accepted an identity that's not you based on what's happened to you. And it's easy to say, you know, I was talking to my wife the other day, and I heard this great testimony from this pastor. His wife did all these things, you know what I mean? And he stood strong. You know, he was there, and God blessed it and brought it all back together. And I said, that's an amazing testimony told by him. But I wonder how hard it would be to be told by her. See, we hear these people that have endured these great things and all these things have happened to them. But what happens when you're the person that made the decision? See, we don't talk about that. Well, what many of you know and many of you don't know, it was, it was about seven years ago, I had a complete breakdown. People didn't do stuff to me. I made a decision, walked away from the ministry, walked away from everything. And in that time, I was in the shadow. I believe that everybody, I was so cynical, I believe that everybody had a motive. Women were trash and men were dogs. I couldn't trust anyone. The truth is I didn't like anyone because I didn't like who I'd become. And I sat there on the back porch in a moment. I couldn't even get around the word of God. I couldn't even hear, I didn't even speak the word of God because it was so convicting to me because I knew the truth. And I remember sitting on the back patio, listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan, smoking his cigar. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. And I remember God telling me one thing, I am with you. And I don't know if I liked it because I didn't deserve it. But it was knowing that, that God was able to pull me through it. He didn't just lift me out. It was still a process of months. But God pulled me through it, reminded me of my identity in him. He replanted me in Eden. It was a reset and a restart. Not everybody liked it, but I did. He replanted me in Eden. He showed me that the calling he put on my life did not pass with my decision, but I aligned myself with his authority and allowed him to bring me through and didn't listen to anybody else. That's what God has for you this year. Just align yourself. You say, God, how long? Long enough. 2019. Draw close to God. He'll draw close to you. Lord, we just pray right now. As we draw close to you, Lord, you draw close to each and every one of us in a real way. Lord, I speak success over everybody in this place, but I also speak significance. That we will make an impact on this city. When we go pray next Sunday night, we're going to believe that there's going to be a shockwave of impact through the city. That when we stand behind the mayor and the authority that you've placed, Lord, that you're going to use him to impact the city. We don't care. If we get any credit, we want you to get the credit. We want to be the Antioch. We want to be the place, we want to be Chandler that starts to see revival and people's lives changing because we've made an impact, because we've made decisions to live outside of ourselves. Lord, that's who we want to be as a church. That's who you've called us to be. Lord, we just draw close to you, draw close to us. If you're in here and you've never given your life to God, that's the first start in drawing close to him. That's why he came and died on the cross is for your sin that separated you. And his promise is the same. Draw close this morning, he'll draw close to you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, he died on the cross, is raised from the dead. And the Bible says you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, you'll be saved. That's what God has for you. If that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Awesome, bro. Come on, man. 2019. Come on, you're ready. You can get excited, get pumped up, man. It's coming. Anybody else? 2019 is your year. Anybody else need to give your life to Jesus? 
Maybe you need to re rededicate this morning. You need that reset button. You haven't been following God and you want to, raise your hand right now. You rededicate right now. Anybody here? Awesome. Yes, yes. Come on. Come on, church. You can do better than that. Come on. We got some resets going on in here. Anybody else? Anybody else? We have time for you. There's lots to do, but we have time for you. Anybody need to rededicate this morning? God's calling you back, drawing you close. Don't leave without hitting that button. Anybody else? Come on, let's just, if you raise your hand to give your life to Jesus, rededicate, we're just gonna ask you to come to the front. Don't worry, we're not gonna embarrass you. You don't gotta talk to Mike. I just wanna pray for you. And you don't have to come alone. Bring someone with you. Just have them stand by you so we know I'm praying for. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. So excited for you guys. This is going to be, this already is the best year ever. Like already, how cool is that? It's one weekend and it's already going to be the best year. You will remember this year for the rest of of your life. This is a marker in your journey. I'm so excited for you guys. So come on, church. We're just going to pray with them as a church. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. According to the word of God this morning, you are a new creation. All the old is past. When people try to remind you of the past, you tell them you don't even remember. Because the Lord has taken it and made you brand new today. You are brand new today. He sees you as if you'd never sinned. Not one thought, not one thing. He sees you as brand new. You need to start seeing yourselves that way. Paul is right here. They're just going to go and pray and get some information with you. You guys go ahead. Let's give them a hand as they go. Awesome. And I'm just going to ask the leaders, some of the leaders to come up front. Kyle, Michelle, Pastor Rudy, Pastor Ike. I want you to come up front. We're just going to give you an opportunity to come and receive ministry. If you need a reset, if you need alignment, if you need a break job, just come forward and receive ministry. We're going to open it up for prayer, but I'm also going to close the service for those of you that want to go. God bless you. Welcome to 2019. We have a table in the back to sign up for encounters. Or if you'd like to volunteer for the prayer event in the city next week, you can write down. You can be a part of the choir or someone that facilitates prayer. Just write it there. God bless you. Go in victory 2019. Have an impact. God bless.